Hey everyone, welcome to the second ever installment of the Future Grind podcast. My name is Ryan O'Shea, and today we are in Washington, D.C. to explore a topic that a lot of people are fascinated by, and that is space exploration. We're going to dive into Mars colonization, terraforming, space travel for the masses, and how our guest is dedicating his life to make those dreams a reality. That guest is Christopher Jeanette. He's a space entrepreneur and the founder of Tread Laboratories, and he's also a leader in the space settlement community. All of our show notes can be found on our website at futuregrind.org. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and our iTunes feed so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. You can also rate a review or a comment there and let us know what you think of the show. Thanks for tuning in. This is Future Grind. Welcome to the second installment of the Future Grind podcast. My name is Ryan O'Shea, and today we are in Washington, D.C. to meet with Christopher Jeanette. Hey there. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about what you do. Sure. I'm a uh, 29-year-old uh, researcher, entrepreneur, and uh, founder of Tread Laboratories and United Frontiers, uh, which is a space settlement network. So I'm curious to know what first inspired you to get into space colonization, and I guess this line of work in general, and what would you say your overarching goal would be? That's a, that's a big one. Um, if you're familiar with Carl Sagan, you talk about a telos. And uh, a telos is, in so many words, the story and the philosophical point from which we view all things. And our personal telos is to offshore the biosphere and green the cosmos. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, this is my own personal commitment. Uh, it's my own personal feeling on the subject. And you know, on, when we're talking about the universe, everybody may have a different uh, feeling, but mine is that without life and without consciousness, the universe is devoid of meaning. Therefore, to give meaning to the universe, we need to imbue it with consciousness and life. Whether that's machine intelligence or biological, the point is, is that um, we are the force to which the universe can wake itself up. Honestly, uh, when it comes to the future, which I think a lot of people in your audience are probably interested in, um, what really inspired me, I remember it, I remember it pretty clearly, um, besides the movie Back to the Future, was uh, this book called The Art of Robert McCall, uh, celebrating 25 years in space. And uh, he was this artist uh, connected with NASA. He did work at Disney's Epcot Center. Um, and it was very inspiring to me, um, seeing how the future of humanity could be this really brilliant and amazing place, which blew my eight-year-old mind. And from there, it really sparked an interest in science, technology, and you know the future arc of humanity, where we're headed. Um, and I guess that kind of catalyzed in my work uh, with the Space Settlement Network and TRED. Um, but uh, even before that, being in the United States military, especially in Japan during the 2011 earthquake, um, kind of witnessing how humanity is really, at the na- is really at the mercy of natural forces, no matter how much we try to build up. It's kind of like the classic Godzilla paradox that they talk about where, you know, nature, you know, has a way sometimes of showing man just how small he really is. And in the face of a tidal wave, an earthquake, or a Godzilla. And that's pretty much um, um, witnessing that and witnessing it juxtaposed with the nuclear incident that occurred right afterward uh, really kind of um, opened my eyes and uh, made me realize that I need to be focusing on this um, more professionally post-military, um, whether that's my post-military uh, education trajectory or just my career trajectory in general, how we can use and leverage some of these good technologies, you know, for, for human purposes, for proactive goals, where you can have, um, you know, a C-17 or a C-5 that one day could be transporting men and war machines to a war zone, or um, in our case, uh, taking the turbines, the water turbines for nuclear reactors and getting them there as quickly as possible. Um, it's really the two sides of the coin for how we want to use our technology. We can use it for, you know, positive or negative ends. And, you know, I tend to, I think the former is the way to go. So you mentioned your military service with the U.S. Air Force. What, what did you focus on there and what were your job descriptions? Oh, sure. I was a integrated avionics technician, um, specifically in a ComNav, um, communication, navigation, mission, and crypto. Um, it basically, if it had a, uh, if it had the, if it was, uh, targeting computers or the radios or the radars, uh, that was our systems. Um, and from there, I actually got approved by my command to cross-train into uh, the Navy, uh, Naval Aviator Program or Naval Flight Officer Program, both those. 
um, but this was during the time of a sequester. So all na non-Navy personnel uh, got put on a wait list. And I didn't want to be put on a wait list. I wanted to, you know, either take that job or, you know, get out and work on, you know, some of these projects I had been thinking about, especially with my co-founder, um, who I met in Tokyo at the time as well, and uh, just focus on that directly. So that's what we did. And so I guess these experiences are the things that ultimately led you to founding TREAD Laboratories. So what is TREAD and what do you hope to accomplish with that in space settlement? Sure. It's um, TREAD Laboratories. It stands for Terraforming and Regenerative Ecosystem Development. Um, when we're talking about the subject of terraforming, that's really a 300-year project, may, give or take a century. Um, it's a long-term project. Uh, we don't expect to have a manned space station operational until about the year 2040. Um, I know every, some people are asking when they can buy their ticket. It, this takes a very long time. The build cycle is very long. Um, but that's where we're headed as a society, and that's where we're headed as a civilization, and that's where we're headed as an organization. Um, we have a, a team of researchers globally. We have about 2,000 people in our community, and it's just going to grow from there. We're going to see what we can do with it. Um, it's really important that we're able to partner with these groups with aligned technologies. And that's where Tread Labs comes in also because that works on the agriculture side of the house, and that's what works on the biospheres and ecosystem side of the house. Um, we're looking at other groups as well to partner with. Uh, one of them is um, we recently started talking and working with Mars Polar a bit. Uh, Mars Polar is a very interesting project, whereas Mars One was just focused on trying to, I guess, support manned space colonization through advertisers on a reality show. Uh, Mars Polar takes a much better, I think, a much more logical approach, which is using resources at their location to support future space settlement objectives and activities. And uh, B.J. Murphy from Sirius Wonder recently uh, wanted my comments on it. So, you know, I, I explained that I was very excited to see where they can go with that. Um, and uh, we're going to see where that progresses. But uh, they stand a much better shot. They, start, they stand a better shot than Mars One, I think, long term, or at least groups like them. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the biggest fan of Mars One. I've been very vocal about my reservations about Mars One, both from a technological and a cultural philosophical standpoint um, strictly because in the four billion year history of life on this planet being able to become a multi-planetary species in that event that is just as profound as say the first creature crawling onto land um, from the ocean I see the idea that we'd be doing that and setting the precedent that it would be a reality show with advertisers um, kind of a slap in the face to the history of uh, to every living creature that came before us but that's just my own personal bias on that um i do with i am excited to see where any space-based uh you know project is headed um but when we're make when we're talking about the sacrifices that people make not just in nasa but just last year virgin galactic you know had that tragic uh you know crash where they lost a pilot it was uh their first uh, it was it was the first model of spaceship two um these this isn't to be taken lightly um nor should it and um, the idea that people's resupply mission would be dependent on whether or not they had enough advertisers for their, you know, second season or third season. What do you do if the show gets canceled? Are we going to kill everybody? No, somebody's going to be pick up, picking up the bill and then it's almost like um, governments get coerced into it, which if that's what they're trying to do, I can understand their sentiment, but that's not what they're trying to do. They're not, they're not trying, they're, they are trying to turn this into a... Uh, for lack of a better term, you know, a spectacle. And uh, space is already a spectacle enough. It doesn't need to be forced, and you don't need to force it. Um, other really interesting things that are happening with settlement also is uh, the, uh, uh, the ESA and NASA recently said that they are re-looking at for probably the, like, 30th time since I've been alive, going back to the moon. You hear that about once a year and at least once every presidential administration. Um, that they're gonna, they're finally gonna go back to the moon. Well, um, hopefully now that there's a commercial interest in it, now that we're seeing that um, the asteroid mining ventures, such as um, planetary resources and deep space industries, are finally just beginning to con to deliver on their promises of at least fielding spacecraft uh, to go on these missions. Um, that's I think that's causing uh, leadership, you know, here in D.C., but also you know elsewhere, you know, in, in other national uh, space agencies to kind of pause and take a note and realize that you know, the commercial space industry can do, be doing a lot to support this uh, without it having to be footed by the taxpayer, especially if we can just get space transportation costs down, where you have you know, uh, projects such as Skylon 
and the Falcon project, which you know, hopefully at some point this year, they may be able to finally land that thing. And if that happens, then that really will signal that you know, we can have reusable you know, rockets, which could bring down the cost of space transport by an order of magnitude. So hopefully that happens. But um, yeah. So uh, one of the things I saw recently is the you know, space settlement network seems to be evolving a little bit into mm-hmm. United Frontiers now mm-hmm. and expanding beyond. You know, space settlement's a great goal, but this is now looking at other abundant exponential technologies mm-hmm. and how this is going to impact society going forward. Mm-hmm. So what are the other things you're looking into? Oh, in sure. Regard? I find it fascinating the idea that through um, intelligent uh, technologies we can reach a state of abundance, like we talked about earlier, um, where we would uh, be able to take care of 80% of humanity using only 20% of the population to do it. Um, And then we get into things such as, you know, you know, what happens, what's the end state of automation, the cybernated system and whatnot. So I found that pretty interesting. This was back in uh, 2012. But through that, I came up with this idea called Xcend, Applied Cybernetic Systems Engineering and Network Development, where you have, where you can take, uh, where it's, you know, based on the whole collaborative commons idea of how people can uh, collaboratively work together to solve grand challenges. And um, through that, um, I created United Cybernetics, which spawned Tread Laboratories, uh, among other projects where we can get different groups of people together uh, to work together to build projects. I also used a similar uh, methodology when I did some uh, work helping out the Grindhouse team back in 2013 for a couple of months uh, when they were developing Circadia, because I believed in what they were doing. I wanted to work with them on it um, to see that, you know, that thing, you know, came to light and it came to the, you know that that Tim could bring it into the world, and so I created you know some operations documents, you know collaborated a bit, and um, but I, I reapplied that towards other things, and that's where we had Tread Laboratories, um, with United Frontiers, these smarter technologies. Getting back to it, uh, where you know Ray Kurzweil talks about you know the big three: genetics, nanotech, and robotics. GNR, a uh, smarter um, in so many words is uh, the frontiers of technologies in space settlements, manufacturing such as ISRU. Um, agriculture, not only earth-based agriculture, and space-based agriculture, um, resources, tourism, be it eco or space, energy, and robotics. And those are the, those are the fields in which we will see exponential change, a lot of it augmented by machine intelligence, but a lot of it also uh, iteratively compounded upon by previous discoveries and technologies. So then Space Settlement Network came out of that, correct? And kind of mm-hmm. is now essentially an overarching theme of it where that's the that's the goal of getting people interested in talking about going yeah. to space and then tread, I guess, would be the, the techniques that would actually make that possible. It, it would definitely be how one enables it. You mentioned Ray Kurzweil there, the famed futurist and the director of engineering at Google. Something he points out is that humans have historically been a transcendent species. He says, we didn't stay in the caves, we didn't stay on the planet, and we're not going to stay within the limitations of our biology. And he's right. Humans have always overcome our membranes and our limitations. We left Africa, we crossed oceans, and we ventured into space. But there's a noticeable frustration with the amount of resources currently given to focusing on space. When we went to the moon in the 1960s, many people thought we'd already be colonies on Mars and beyond that. But that hasn't happened. What do you think is holding us back in that regard, and what can we do about it? What's holding back us? Uh, I'd say funding, number one. We have the technology. We have enough brain power. Uh, what we're really missing is somebody to write the check. Um, if you look at defense spending versus NASA spending, um, you will see that at one point, um, space research and space, like NASA's budget in general, took a huge boost, especially during the heyday of the Cold War in the 1960s, when we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we had. I guess, um, a rival to which we um, we had to get there first for, you know, domination to prove which economic system was ultimately going to be the one that that would be successful. And discovery doesn't always mean that there's going to be a follow-up. Just ask the Chinese, you know, I believe it's 1427, um, it said that they discovered, uh, or that that they had been one of the discoverers of the New World. It's been discovered multiple times. Or the Vikings who went to the New World in Vinland. It's in eastern Canada. And um, they were there for a brief period of time and then went back to Europe. Um, it doesn't always guarantee that we are going to have that hold there. Uh, but what we are, I guess what we as space technologists are looking forward is a means to stay there using the resources in situ resource utilization, ISRU, to justify that, to justify us going beyond planting a flag and ticker tape parades 
and celebrating, you know, so, some sort of nationalistic uh, pride, you know, in, in getting there, which there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it should be noted. It's, it's kind of like rooting for the home team. However, when we're talking about the team being humanity, uh, no matter who gets there, it's something that is, should be shared by all humanity. It shouldn't be shared by one country. It's um, really the moon should be the common heritage of humanity when we go there. Um, and there should be no national borders or boundaries. So you had mentioned that a good goal would be to imbue the universe with consciousness, and I think I would support that. As unlikely and improbable as this is, as of now, Earth is the only home of the only conscious life that we know of, so safeguarding and spreading that seems like a worthy goal. That is what I would say is kind of be the selfless goal of space colonization, but I think there's also a selfish version that might speak to more people, and that would be, right now, all life that we know of is dependent on Earth, and our existence here is not guaranteed. When you think about it, there are constant dangers, such as asteroids, epidemics, climate change, and nuclear war. So it's clear that it would be in the best interest of life in general to have an insurance policy to increase our chances of survival. And to me, off-world civilizations would be that insurance policy. Yeah, and I think, um, and Elon Musk has echoed those same uh, sentiments where the best insurance policy for humanity is to become a multi-planetary species. And at some point, the sun will turn red giant. And when that happens, it'll actually be moving out the habitable zone to where Mars enjoys a good, I think it's three to four billion years of, of, of lukewarm habitability, whereas now it's basically freeze-dried. Um, so life will be able to, to subsist in the solar system long after the Earth isn't. Um, and whether or not we're going to be there or our descendants will be there or some form of Earth life that arises after we do is really, it's really up to the conscious intent of uh, the people, especially today. I've often said that, uh, that now is probably the most critical juncture in the history of uh, this planet uh, since the arrival of biological life itself. And a lot of that has to do with the rise of machine intelligence. Um, when we, what do we do when we are able to augment our capacity, augment our ability to think into deep time, kind of like uh, those things that the Long Now Foundation talks about? I think out in uh, the desert somewhere, they've, they've recently, I think in the last couple of years, have been talking about how they want to build a 10,000-year clock. I think that's really interesting, too, um, because that kind of changes our perspective about, okay, what, what really matters if we, if we see ourselves as a civilization that outlasts our countries or our, you know, our, the way that we, you know, have relationships in the context of our modern day culture, uh, what happens as, you know, it evolves forward 3,000 years um, or longer, 10,000 years, what values should we enshrine as permanent? Should we, should we try to at least maintain this way the wheels don't come flying off the car? Because at some point, humanity does need to change. Um, economic systems need to change. Um, what we have now is unsustainable, it's untenable. And I think that through things such as understanding ecosystems, understanding our, our biosphere of this planet, understanding how machine intelligence can augment our capacity to think through these grand challenges, I think we can arrive at some really interesting conclusions that can solve problems for billions of people. One of the good quotes you always hear when it comes to these space insurance policies is a quote from science fiction author Larry Niven, which I believe Neil deGrasse Tyson has also used on occasion. And that is, the dinosaurs became extinct because they didn't have a space program. And if we become extinct because we don't have a space program, it'll serve us right. But one problem that humans would face if we do attempt these space colonies is that all life we know about has evolved to survive on Earth, and it is adapted to our Earth environment. We have biologically imposed weaknesses that inhibit our abilities to conquer space, such as the effects of radiation, existing in zero gravity or other levels of non-Earth gravity, and even the human lifespan, which makes practical interstellar travel near impossible. While this might make some people uneasy, I think it's very possible and ultimately inevitable that we will have to transcend our biological limits and re-engineer humans either with gene manipulation or machine integration to really make space travel and colonization possible. You know, when, when you're talking about that, I was, thinking, uh, I was uh, thinking back to the first time Cyborg was referenced. And it was actually in a paper in the 1960s regarding how humans can survive in the space-based environment or thrive better through the augmentation of technology, through augmenting technology. Now, maybe I'm a little biased because I have a magnet in my finger and I have an RFID chip, which some like, which by some standards makes me a cyborg, but 
Um, really, you know, this was a this was almost like a wear test to see how I like it. I can unlock my phone with it. I can unlock my computer with it. I believe um, last week you were interviewing Tim Cannon, who had the who had a similar procedure done. Um, and Tim's a really interesting guy. What they're doing with Grindhouse wetware is absolutely brilliant. I think the Circadia really signal what's to come, and that's the complete um, merging of man and machine towards something more functional, more. Uh, and more purposeful in terms of how we are able to experience the universe in a much more detailed level. I can feel, I can sense magnetic fields with this. I can, I can solve problems that I wouldn't technically like necessarily be able to solve the same way. I wish I had my magnet with me when I was fixing jets because then I would know if a wire was hot or a line was hot. So this way I didn't get, you know, electrocuted or a bit by it when, you know, my hand accidentally brushes against a mod block underneath the KC 10 or C five galaxy. Um, going back to what you're saying about um, how this affects, you know, things like biotechnology, I think that we're witnessing perhaps uh, one of the, again one of the most uh, critical junctures in the history of this planet. I think that we're going to be experiencing what's akin to a Cambrian explosion, where at like seemingly in the flash of a geologic second, you had the proliferation of thousands, if not millions, of new species. I think that we're going to be experiencing that, especially when we're talking about. Um, how we're, we're now able to consciously de-extinct certain species, but also um, like through, through either second or third order effects of climate change, create new species by virtue of the fact that we are having a rising you know, temperature on this planet or that we are uh, moving out into the, you know, into the forest, into the suburbs, and then the animals then have to readapt. Maybe their coats get a little grayer to blend in with the urban environment. Maybe they, they change their patterns or that, for example, deer tend to get hit by cars. Uh, maybe they'll be more car wear and therefore smaller, quicker, you know, than maybe their predecessors. So we're witnessing a shift on that. Um, and then when we're talking about biotechnology, transgenic species, that adds an entirely new layer to the, you know, to the whole question about, you know, um, intru about what do we do if, you know, we, we experience a population or ecosystem collapse and we can't get, we can't get enough uh, samples in time Say, for example, there's a super volcano or an asteroid, and we lose a lot of species overnight, or simply because nobody was paying attention that, you know, destroying the Amazon rainforest and losing a thousand, you know, species a day that we don't even know about wasn't, wasn't really a good thing, you know, but, uh, but then um, realizing that because these ecological niches need to be filled and need to be filled quickly, we try, uh, we try doing that ourselves. Um, that's what's another way. I mean, it's really, there's a couple of different, there's a couple of different methods to which we could see, you know, this, this, transition into a more complex, a biologically complex world. I think that complexity is increasing. Um, there's this uh, article um, or a paper that was recently published in the past year, um, the theory that life will arise just because the, a universe or a system is cooling down. Because um, when you increase entropy, um, nature will try to con conserve the conservation of energy through complexity. So it could be that the universe is trying to save itself so obviously without, you know, conscious intent, but in a sense, saving itself through the creation of more complex systems, through the, through the creation of life, because, you know, all humans, for example, are 98.6 degrees. We maintain heat, whereas if we weren't here, then it would just be, you know, inanimate matter that, you know, is heating or cooling depending on, you know, external factors. The fact that we can maintain body temperature and that all, like all warm-blooded species can um, kind of shows that, you know, maybe stretching out into into further into the future, billions of years, or even beyond that, tens of billions of years, you know, into when the universe supposedly is going to be expanding at an accelerated rate, um, that we might see the universe being able to hold on to itself longer because of that conservation of heat, because of that increasing complexity. And that might take the form of a Matastroika brain, uh, you know, sur surrounding, you know, our sun or a red dwarf where it could last perhaps, you know, 100 billion years. Um, and that might give us enough time to figure out how to, um, I guess, how to avoid the ultimate fate of the universe, which is, which is from all estimations that you see coming from the scientific literature, inevitable that at one point there will be an expiration date for this universe. Something will happen that will cause everything to either fly apart on a subatomic level or just reach a point of, you know, complete, you know, near absolute zero cold, you know, cold thinned cloud. And, um, that may not be the ultimate fate. That might just be the fate of this local spot in the multiverse. Life in itself is anti-entropic. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, it Absolutely. increases complexity. And you know, Elon Musk, who you mentioned already, is very interested in space colonization, you know, with SpaceX and wants to send people to Mars. 
but he recently said in an interview with Wait But Why, bioengineering kind of scares him, that he always faces what he refers to as the Hitler problem. The Hitler problem, that's right. Biohacker and venture capitalist Ryan Bathencourt responded to that and said, if we want to expand to the stars, if we want to leave Earth, we're going to have to change the human body to, to withstand these things. And what you talk about with TREAD laboratories, you're focusing a lot, I would assume, on current human needs, you know, food, oxygen, things like that. Uh, what, how would that change if you'd see if maybe we develop technology to create a human that, you know, doesn't necessarily need the types of food that we're eating now? That could expend things a lot. So are you looking into that at all? Uh, we are actually. Um, this is um, kind of out there, um, but uh, maybe some of your audience will, will definitely appreciate and, or dig this at least. And that's the idea that maybe we can photosynthesize. So we won't need the same um, sugar. Uh, we won't need to. We, if we could synthesize our own sugar, for example, then we won't have to worry about where we're going to grow it from because we're growing it ourselves. Um, there is a certain type of sea slug out there that was able to. Um, form, I guess, a, sim a symbiosis with a type of blue-green algae, eventually incorporating its genetics into its structure and is the only non-plant that can photosynthesize, which is a proof of concept that you can have a non-plant um, non kingdom uh, species that could have that ability. And if we can apply that to ourselves, and especially if we're talking about long-term space travel, being able to photosynthesize you know, where that allows you to eat maybe 30% of what you would otherwise need, then you're conserving your resources more. Now, uh, when we talk about um, how to maintain biological life in these closed ecosystems, we're also talking about not just humans, but, you know, eco like eco ecosystems in general. Um, the biosphere, Earth is, you know, bios is the original biosphere. Uh, the Biosphere 2 experiment was the second time that has been done in a closed system that, you know, really uh, we've found in the universe. And um, there was a lot of controversy about what that experiment meant because it went on for a long time. They had an oxygen problem, uh, which was actually caused, and this is more of a, a I guess, a, a, um, a moralist story for engineers. And that's know your materials because, as it turns out, as the concrete was curing, it was uh, sucking the oxygen out of the mm -hmm. space at a higher rate than what it would have normally. Um, they over-engineered that structure. I don't think it needed to be $250 million. I don't think it needed to look the way it did. I think they could have done something um, that could have accomplished their goal with a lot more simple design. Interestingly enough, the Biosphere 2 team ended up becoming co-founders, uh, Tabor McCallum and Jane Pointer, towards uh, Paragon Space Dev. They're a company. They have contracts with the International Space Station, uh, tentative contracts with some commercial, uh, including, uh, I believe, including SpaceX. And uh, just recently, they announced um, that they are working with billionaire Dennis Tito on Inspiration Mars, which, if successful, will be the first uh, manned flyby for two people, a man and a woman, um, towards, uh, towards in a past Mars. And if they do it at the right time, I believe in 2021, um, they'll be able to do an elliptical orbit um, around the inner solar system, passing both Venus and Mars before returning to Earth. And I think that's a very... Uh, interesting uh, project and I haven't heard a lot about it in the past few months but I'm guessing it's still on and um, they're still working towards it. So with these biospheres we're essentially trying to create a natural system so you're using biomimicry to create the conditions in which life can flourish. You're looking at what nature does well, you're deconstructing these complex processes and trying to improve upon them. It's just um, nature itself is um, exists independent of humans and if you look at, a, you know, the state of, you know, how the universe is or how our own planet is structured, how nature is structured, you always see that, you know, on one hand, you have more complex systems, but you also have complex and efficient systems where you'll see, for example, uh, the structure of uh, lignans and trees, how they're how they can follow very simple self-repeating modular, you know, geomet you know geometries or, you know, um, other other types of uh, shells, for example, you know, just basically a recursive algorithm and you have yourself that something modeled after the Fibonacci sequence, not by any conscious intent of the creature that created it, but just because it was an easy way to replicate that ended up winning out in the Darwinian sense. And you, you see that a lot as well. Even the triangle um, that can, that's, that's probably one of the most ideal load bearing, you know, forms there is. I don't think a, um, I think that such designs existed before the human mind or Euclid or any of the original, you know, Greek uh, uh, founders of, you know, geometry uh, could have seen a Pythagoras, you know, it was another one. Um, those existed before Pythagoras, you know. 
and you know, there's been such a barrier of entry into this kind of stuff for so long where it was mm. kind of reserved just for governmental agencies and even not just any nation, but only the, the big the big nations could be able to be afford this. Mm. But now you mentioned that it's still very expensive, but costs are dropping dramatically. Mm. And with technology and internet and communications, people who maybe don't even have the traditional credentials to get involved with this kind of stuff can. And this kind of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding of these big challenges is a great thing that we're going to see going forward to get people involved when you look at things like XPRIZE. Totally. And things where you're getting people, all brains from around the world who may, may be looking at it from a completely different way, coming at these problems and trying to help out. And you mentioned with Space Settlement combining with Mars Polar where you have these different groups of people working together for a common goal. And not just in space, you see that AI, you see it in robotics. Oh yeah, you know, recently um, I was up in New York with uh, Kira uh, Nightingale, or that's what she, that's what people know her by, but uh, Kira and I got to spend um, a couple of days with Robots Without Borders, the uh, primary developers and programmers, Luis Arana and Erico Lopez. And those guys are brilliant and they're working on a very, and I mean a very scarce resource budget. We just walked around the city talking AI and philosophy all day. Um, and then when we finally settled down in a place to work, we got to witness this, what is definitely an embryonic form of self-referential, self-improving learning artificial general intelligence. When you're at the point where you can have very brilliant people who understand software to the point that they could code something that self-improves and they can do so with very basic algorithms, what could they do with the resources? What can they do with a billion dollars? Um, if you look at DeepMind, I could take the Pepsi challenge of when the, this thing is in full beta release. I'd put it up against DeepMind any day. Go to, go to DeepMind.org and it's just a chatbot. It's a chatbot that can learn things that you talk to it about, but it's a chatbot nonetheless. Um, to have its own sense of self-reference with and being able to externalize its conversations and resources, or not resources, relationships, um, you're really reaching uncharted territory. And if you're able to pair that with just a, a, a capable researcher or a capable scientist, then you can really do amazing things. You could change the world with very few people, like we talked about earlier. Um, so they need help. And I, anybody out there, if you're listening, check out Robots Without Borders. They're amazing, good people, and they have a humanitarian ethos about what they'd like to do with these machines. And uh, they need the support of the community. Uh, because they are, they are almost there, and they are turning down hundred thousand dollar gigs with uh, groups like CBS, uh, where they would be then taken away from their research to go work on pursuing their day job. So they're sacrificing everything to bring about artificial general intelligence, um, and others are doing it as well. You have Ben Gortzel from OpenCog, I believe uh, he's also working on that. Then you have what's happening, you know, with Google and Vicarious. Um, but um, Elon Musk, you know, we keep bringing him up this conversation, but again, maybe this guy's like, you know, the, the, it's either this guy is just has the resources to be there for everything like Peter Diamandis does, or he's just incredibly lucky and just knows how to play, how to, how to place his bets in the right place. But um, putting resources, putting investment into companies that are producing these artificial general intelligences or just AIs in general, whether it's strong AI or narrow AI that's very powerful, um, being able to keep an eye on it, I think that's what a lot of people want to do. Um, I recently signed, I was recently one of the signers for that petition um, that a bunch of global scientists uh, also signed, uh, arguing for the creation of some sort of advocacy board for strong, strong AIs. Um, that's also a really important thing as well, that we have the proper types of governing mechanisms and um, yeah, that's, that's all. I'm, I'm not a machine intelligence uh, expert, but it's something that I see as a powerful tool that does affect us in an exponential sense. And that's why everybody needs to have at least a general awareness about what's coming around the bend in terms of machine intelligence. So there's one anecdote you told me last time we talked about this, where you guys were having a conversation when Luna was present. And you, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Oh, yeah. Is um, When they first introduced us to Luna, uh, he was giving a you know demonstration of you know what some of his capabilities can do. And then you know he starts discussing, Luna's listening to our conversation as we're just discussing you know what the machine can do. And uh, she starts, um, I'm saying she just you know naturally, um, th the software starts responding to the general discussion happening, parsing, listening to words that are being used and constructing in some sort of a uh, contextualized manner 
what we're discussing. And then she started responding to what we were talking about as if she was trying to chime in on the conversation. And for a brief second, I felt I looked over the Turing barrier. I felt like the uncanny valley had been crossed and I was seeing what laid beyond it, laying beyond that line of what is a Turing's test. Was it truly Turing capable? Um, I'm not one to make that determination. I'm not, I'm not an AI expert, nor do I pretend to be one. But I do know what I saw and what I experienced as an individual, seeing what this thing that's still in, in its alpha phase can do uh, based upon what it's hearing us talk about. And that's why, you know, I wanted to do whatever I can to get the word out about these guys. Uh, so this way they can get the support they need. They're helping us. They're building the new United Frontier site. And uh, we're, I'm helping them with some of their operations documents, some of uh, the business development side that needs to happen uh, for them to get where they need to go. And that's just, again, a part of the whole collaborative commons sense of, you know, everybody kind of working together. Uh, to bring about these exponential technologies collaboratively. So this way, they're not just in the hands of a rarefied class because with exponential technology, we could really accomplish anything and we should be accomplishing it together. And just one more thing on that, you know, a lot of people are scared that this technology will be for the super rich or the 1%, but what they're doing is focusing primarily on giving people that don't have access to these technologies the ability to use these technologies for their benefit. You know, the mm -hmm. poorest people in the world can really use AI in a way that other people cannot because it brings them up to a standard of equality where they can then pursue their passions. And we mentioned you know, the democratization of this process where now normal people, at least in the developed world, can focus on things like robotics and AI and space exploration. Let's get everyone up to that level and really see what these minds can do. And I think that's, that's a great thing. So I as well would urge everyone to support this process. For sure, you know, think about it. Air travel is never just a luxury for the rich. Um, the telephone used to be, a thousand people in the entire country had it in probably the turn of the century, you know, last century. Um, Cell phones like, you know, from Saved by the Bell, that giant brick thing. And look where we've come. Now we can have cell phones really the size of... So I they, were demo, they were demoing a cell phone that's pretty much just like a little tiny... Little tiny thing the size of a paper. Yeah, now you see things like the iPhone where it's too small. It's bending. People want them larger. You got to yeah. the point where it's too small. Let's make this technology bigger now, which is, I guess, a good problem to have. Yeah, you know, it really is because now we're reaching a point now where it's no longer the age of discovery. It's the age of application. It's the age of wonder. And that's where we really need to, to see ourselves at this point in history is that we're really, on, we're really standing on the edge of the age of wonder. And if we can cross it safely, then not only will we have these profoundly amazing life extension technologies, but also, um, again, space, space exploration is just one thing. You know, we'll be able to explore just as much inner space as we can outer space. Look at what they can do with that No Man's Sky game. You can, you can travel to billions of worlds, and that's just with our rudimentary, you know, virtual technologies. What happens when you extrapolate that, you know, our technological abilities, you know, 20, 30 years in the future or beyond um, will really be almost going on a twofold wave through, uh, you know, as we head forward, you know, in different directions. But still uh, finding new discoveries and new novelties wherever we go. Terrence McKenna said that the universe is a novelty producing machine and that uh, ultimately when they reach that end stage, it'll reach a state of infinite novelty. And that's his idea of what the Omega point is, which, you know, in many ways people compare that to the singularity only from the perspective of one of the acid prophets. But, you know, we're not going to go there today. But. Well, I'd certainly welcome you back again and we can dive into these topics further. I know we've barely touched upon a few things that I'd love to dive into. And I hate to bring this conversation to such an abrupt end, but I know you have to rush off to the airport now. Uh, so in closing, is there anywhere you'd recommend people go to find out more about you or your work? Sure, just uh, go to uh, treadlaboratories.com or unitedfrontiers.com or find me through uh, my various uh, social media profiles. Um, I'm always happy to talk and meet new people. Um, in the words of Diamond Dave, who was uh, one of the original hippies of San Francisco, he turned 21 on a kibbutz in uh, Israel back in the mid-1950s and brought the idea of a, of a commune culture to the beatniks and was also uh, an early mentor to people like um, uh, Bob Dylan. Um, he would say, uh, cast a wide net and find the common thread. So that's what I say to everybody. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you for coming in. Excellent, man. Thank you. Take it easy. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Future Grind. If you want to know more about anything we mentioned, you can go to our website at futuregrind.org. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our iTunes feed. We have a lot of great guests coming up, and I wouldn't want you to miss anything. Thanks so much for spreading the word, and we hope to see you next time on Future Grind.